Hey guys, how's it going? Doug or Deerfoot FPV here. Uh, I just wanted to kind of discuss a little bit today. Um, there is always a lot of drama and whatnot discussing commercial versus hobby, what is legal, what is not, how can I do things with my drone, how can I, why can't I do this? But I can tell you there are certain things that have been around since before drones were even in existence that you have needed to do and it's one of those things that's not really talked about much and that is ham licensing um, your ham radio license uh, or getting your technicians license is one of the necess necessary things to do if you are getting into drones if you're getting into ham radio even for that matter um, if you want to use frequencies other than the common bands like your cell phone um, the ones that are legally certified that you can just buy a product off the shelf and use those you don't have to worry about because someone's already taking care of that work for you. They have adjusted their products to work legally within our country. Now, with drones, with things that need to go long distances, with people who want to push the boundaries in the industry, whether you want to be a tinkerer or whether you just want to have fun, the ham license is one of the things that nobody really ever talks about but does need to happen. And today I want to talk to you about how to get one, what it takes to study for one, where are these resources, and what the heck do I need to know. But if you want to get into long range, if you want to use some products that aren't necessarily bought right off the shelf, then you're going to need to know a little bit more about what's legal in our country as well. Being around DC, there is a lot of, a lot of air traffic. There is a lot of frequency going along, around as well, too. So. Obviously, not a lot of it's going to be audible to us. We're not going to hear all the radio chatter. But other than just the um, ham frequencies and uh, walkie frequencies, other public band frequencies like your phones, we also have government frequencies here. So whether it be the CIA or whoever is doing their work here, FBI, things like that, we all have those offices around here, and they might just as well be using government frequencies to, uh, uh, to have a conversation with some sort of tech elsewhere in the world. Um, if we are using products that are not falling within this legality, or if we don't know anything about these frequencies for that matter, that can pose a problem for this. And it's really just to protect our country, to make sure that we can have safe chatter, there's no interference when we need something important to go through, and specifically for emergency purposes. Um, the ham radio frequencies aren't necessarily widely used, but for uh, small emergency groups and things like that that do need the frequencies for a, a free service, they don't necessarily need to pay for an emergency service system with the dispatcher and all that. They can have, um, if you're just a group of one or two people in a search and rescue team and you're out in the middle of nowhere, you can have a ham radio set up, however it be mobile or local and you can um, use that technology in order to receive messages, send messages, in order to work with emergency services. Um, in that sense, we need to make sure that we're keeping the air clear, we're not interrupting everyone, and it is very important that we are licensed correctly so that we don't eventually get in trouble as well. Um, right now, yeah, you gotta follow your Part 107, abide by the FAA rules that are for hobby as well as commercial, but the part that isn't really discussed, which is interesting, is that ham radio, um, uh, or the FCC, has a little bit more uh, gumption, I would say, in um, enforcing their laws. Um, just recently, we could talk about GetFPV. There was a discussion, if you watched uh, the recent podcast, but they spoke with Tim Nelson, who was the owner of GetFPV and Lumineer. Um, and was fined by the FCC by utilizing and selling, for selling products, not utilizing, but for selling products that fell outside of the legal bans of the US. And that was a pretty hefty fine. And in that actual discussion, he mentions that we are one of the first companies this has happened to in this industry. They are trying to make an example out of us. So given that point, you should kind of 
take to take an answer from that and say, well, if they're starting to come after them, we need to pay attention and make sure that they're not going to come after the individuals as well. And to do that, you need to make sure you're licensed, make sure you're safe, and make sure you're keeping the airways clear. So no, 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 I'm not trying to say that you're going to get arrested the next time you go flying. But it is something that we do need to be mindful of as an industry to progress forward and play nicely with all the agencies, all the different committees and groups within the government. With everything progressing as it is, the government's also going to be paying attention. We need to make sure that we are being safe. And in order to do so, these are the steps that you're going to need to take in order to, think, to get your license, to hang on to it, and how you stay up to date with that. Okay, so what exactly do you need to bring to this test? your driver's license first and foremost, but there's also some materials and supplies that you'll need to have with you as well. Before it comes time for the test, you need to actually uh, register for what's called an FRN, and that is basically a mock number or a FCC number, identification number, that they give you um, so that you don't have to give the license or the, the uh, exam proctor uh, your social security number. Uh, apparently that used to be part of the process and now it's not, so you have to go online and physically register it for, register for it for yourself. It's pretty easy to find. If you search FCC FRN registration, you will find it pretty much immediately. It is the first link that pops up on Google. But uh, basically, you click on the link, you go through that, and it will have you put in some basic information. It is a free process, and uh, once you hit submit, um, after putting in your basic information, it will give you the FRN number. Um, that is, I believe, a permanent number. You don't have to worry about changing it, and you will always be registered through the FCC with that number. Uh, keep this paper printed out. Make sure you save a screenshot of it if you can as well. But basically, this will allow you to go to the test and show them your registered ID number to say, I am with the FCC. I'm ready to do this. All right, so one of the biggest resources that you're going to find for ham licensing, ham radio in general, is the ARRL, or the American Radio Relay League, which is an organization that is everything ham radio. If you need products, if you need seminars, if you need classes, if you want to meet people, basically the same thing for drones. There's an industry for us, there is an industry for ham radio. There's a lot of people that love uh, talking to people across the world um, and just having the equipment to do so. Uh, it's Some of it's very technical with learning about antennas and how to bounce your, um, your uh, transmission through the ionosphere to land somewhere else across the world. There's lots of cool, interesting, nerdy things that you can learn about it if you're interested. Uh, but for the most part, all of us are going to be doing it for drones, and that's what you'll be researching. So go to ARRL.org. That's going to be the main site for them. That's where you'll find everything about classes and um, study sessions, study materials, as well as signing up for tests and information about finding tests. So um, this is where I found mine. I basically just went to the links about finding uh, licensing, education, and training. You go through that and you will find uh, find an exam near me. I found an, uh, an exam within a couple of weeks. I hadn't studied one single bit and I basically just cranked it out. I made sure to put a bunch of time aside and um, study as hard as I could for the test. Keep taking practice tests over and over and over. Um, I did also speak with the contact that's listed on the ARRL, well, or ARRL well, website and it allowed me to learn a little bit more about the test if I had any questions. Um, it actually, mine is actually a free test, which is pretty cool. Some of them cost $15 to $20, because I know that'll be a question. Um, some of them are free, as I'm going to experience, which is pretty cool. It depends on the um, chapter that does the examination. Um, I also found that uh, eham.net has a great resource for practice exams and they take old uh, tests from different years and uh, just like we have for uh, our 107 tests, you can take re resources from past years and take practice tests and see um, how you do on those before you even go in. So I actually went through a lot of that, but um, I took them as long as I could. That was my main resource of studying is I just kept going through the tests until I started passing them. That way I did memorize a lot of the material. I would always review what I went, did wrong 
in that way I could kind of learn a little bit about the facts as well as um, absorb it at the same time and learn their test taking um, kind of strategies. All right, so as you hop onto the eham.net site, you can see um, there are three different options for tests that you can take, the technician, general, and extra. If you want to go higher in the levels, it gives you more opportunities to use higher power levels and things like that. Um, you really only do need the technician level though. So if you select that and take current exam, it will open up the 35 multiple choice questions to get you started on uh, taking your first test. This will be very similar questions. I believe these are pulled from a pool. Um, at this time of the video, it's at tw uh, questions from 2014, I believe. But um, if you go through the questions, um, whatever you select, no matter what they are, um, at the very end, you hit check answers here, and that will basically go reload the page and show you what you got right, what you got wrong, and um, it won't tell you why, uh, but it will give you a full percentage at the bottom. Um, if you've passed, you'll actually need to reload the URL up top and just go to exams again to reload from the beginning. Um, and then you can select technician and take the exam again. Um, uh, if you have not passed, it's much easier. It just says retry at the bottom. So you have that opportunity. Uh, but if you pass, it asks you to keep going on and it doesn't allow that reload option. So for that matter, if you get to started on these questions, go through it until you start passing it. Once you're passing it, I would say you have enough information to go further into the information. Uh, but this is how I got started. I took it probably 10 or 15 times within a week, and that way I was able to learn the information slowly, um, as well as learn the strategies for the test itself. You need a 74% to pass, which I believe means that you need at least 26 questions, 27 questions to pass. Um, so not too difficult, but it is um, something you should study for. Other materials I used were things like this YouTube video by David Bottomley, which is the Introduction to Ham Radio and Technician Training class. It was an hour and a half, but this was the last thing I did before I went on to my test. I just watched it in the morning as I was getting ready and I had it playing in the background. So it gave me some information while I was doing mundane tasks and it helped me study as well. Other helpful materials would be things like learning the cue signals for different uh, CW calls in ham radio. Uh, a couple of the questions on the test did contain or pertain to these uh, questions. You don't need to memorize all of them, uh, but they're, they're relatively easy to learn. There's only a handful of them. I mainly needed to remember QSY and QRM. QRM is, is my transmission being interfered with, signal interference, and QSY, which I believe is shall I change my frequency um, or change your frequency. So these are just abbreviations to make um, the changing of communications faster. Um, sometimes you don't always want to spell out words if you're using Morse code or however it's being sent. Um, so these signals are one of the options that are available to hammers in order to send messages faster. The formulas that you're going to need for this test are very basic. Um, for the most part, Ohm's law will be covered. Um, that's your voltage, current, and resistance and how to calculate each of them. This table will show you the difference between them and how to kind of vary the difference between the um, signifiers they use. Voltage is E and current is I in this example. That can be a little bit confusing if you're looking at this for the first time. R makes sense because it's resistance, but um, it might take a little bit of memorization for your first time. So just make sure you're paying attention to that. Another way to look at these would be in the PI or PIV method. It's just another way of using the same Ohm's law, except this time you will be calculating watts, uh, which is signified by power or P. And finally, there will be a little bit of touching upon the wavelength calculation. They might give you the frequency and they might ask you how, uh, what meter band is that on. And to do that, you will be given one of the, or two of the three variables here. So generally it will be your wavelength is the speed of light divided by frequency. Speed of light is 300 million meters per second. That is simplified to 300 if you're using uh, megahertz. So as long as you're in that range, it, you can simplify it down. Otherwise, you will need to move the decimal after you calculate this out. Okay guys, we're gonna go uh, take our ham test. Um, 
put it into the GPS. We'll uh, just go down to, oh, my town here is going to be Alexandria for my exam, but we'll see how it goes. I'm a sinner, season, beginner, lucky to be alive. I'm a sinner, finished my dinner, now I can go outside. If only yesterday. It's the Masonic Memorial for all you Illuminati fans over there. Pretty funny right there. How the fudge am I supposed to be this? Alright. Wonder if I can get through there, because I'm gonna do it. Oh yeah. We are in Old Town Alexandria, and I am two minutes away from the test site. All right, so I have arrived at the test location. Um, it is like at a back side of a church. So I'm gonna go take my test. Wish me luck, guys. Two hours later. All right, guys, so it's raining outside right now, so I'm kind of limited on the video I can take, but um, I just finished with my ham test, and I passed, pretty pumped. Um, so I'm officially good to go. I have like two days or so where I actually need to um, wait for it to be registered on the website but for the most part um, guys this is how you do the process this is how you get it done um, if you guys have any questions let me know I'm happy to help you out so. okay so now that you're done with your ham test you do um, need to wait a couple of days similar to the 107 exam basically it just allows the paper time to get processed and everybody to put it into the system but it, there is a website the paper they give you tells you the website for the FCC that will give you the database of when to check and where to check and that will basically be your signifier um, they don't issue paper licenses anymore apparently so you have to physically go print one out if you want the copy of it um, but after that couple of days, you're ready to go on air if you want to do actual radio work. Otherwise, you are set to start using um, more open vans within the um, technician uh, amateur license. Uh, if you want to go further than that, if you want to work on higher outputs or really work on big projects like that, uh, then you're going to need to either work towards a general license or even an amateur extra. Those are a similar process. Uh, I think the general is another 35 question test. I actually was offered to take it and I, since I was there, I just decided to take it anyway, but I didn't pass. So I would come back and take that one again. And if I wanted to go a step above that, I would go for the amateur extra. So once you have that, it is going to be instated for 10 years. You will be able to hold on to that for a while. And it would be in supplement to your 107 or your AMA license or your uh, FAA registration, whatever is going on with that at the time, um, for the FAA for hobby use. So um, depending if you're commercial or hobby, this is necessary for you. Um, if you want to use higher power bands, I believe you're only allowed to use like 100 milliwatts of power on your transmitter. So for you guys that are running 200 milliwatts, 600 milliwatts, you need to make sure you have a ham license. Otherwise, eventually there could be the chance of fining you or other repercussions. Currently, there isn't really a big problem with it, which is why it hasn't been talked about very much. It's more so just a, um, to make sure you're following all the rules, let's, let's do this correctly. And we already discussed why it's important for safety reasons. Okay guys, well thanks for listening to my long rambling speech about getting your ham license, but make sure you do it, commercial or hobby, it is necessary for us, and for the government to start paying attention and approve things that we are would like to have happen in our industry, we need to make sure we're following all their rules as well. Uh, this being one of them, it's obvious they are starting to crack down on the business side of things, let's make sure we have our end covered just so that we don't have any examples to give them. Yeah.